Good evening, happy people. It's good to be with you tonight for our daily devotional scripture that encourages you to pray. We're going to pause to pray tonight, and I'm so excited. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 9, and um, this is taken from the assigned reading for September 12th. One of the things I like to do is work ahead on my sermons and, and just look at the scriptures. And so this morning, one of the things that I got to do was spend a couple of hours looking at the gospel reading for September 12th, and uh, it's just a tremendous blessing. So looking forward to sharing with you some of the things that uh, I got to, uh, to to learn, and I pray that it's a blessing for you. Good evening, Dellen. It's great to be with you. Please say hi to Gerardo. And uh, just want to encourage everybody as you're joining uh, to say hi to each other, use lots of positive emojis, thumbs up, smiley faces, all those sorts of things. When you do that, you're doing the work of the evangelist. You know, it's, uh, it can be embarrassing when we forget things. You know, as a, as a dad, um, when you are asked, you know, uh, what are the birth dates, month, day, year of, of your children, and you struggle to remember them, uh, that, that can be embarrassing, especially, <laughs> especially when your, your kids are standing right there and they just kind of go, before I even start, before a uh, hypothetical dad even starts to try to answer the question, you know, uh, it can be embarrassing. I'm just, I'm just going to put that out there. That, that can be embarrassing. Um, you know, it can be embarrassing uh, when you misplace a member's name, a church member's name, you know, and you're, you're trying to remember, you know, it, 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 but it's not coming to you. I'm just saying it, it, it can be, uh, it can be embarrassing. Um, it can be embarrassing when you're talking along and, and you forget what your point was. <laughs> a lot of things, you know, can be embarrassing um, when you forget them. It appears that the disciples in the text for tonight, it appears that they may very well have forgotten to pray before trying to cast out a particular demon. So we're going to look at this tonight and... Um, uh, I believe we're going to be tremendously blessed as, as we just let God's word do what God's word is intended to do. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you don't ever forget us. And uh, we thank you that you know all of our needs. We thank you that we can come to you in prayer. And we pray for your blessings upon our time. Thank you for the gift of your word and for the powerful effect that it has upon our faith and upon our life. And so we pray, Father, that you would... Uh, plant your word deep within our hearts and minds that it would uh, bear the fruit in our lives that you desire. We thank you for the good works that we are permitted to do today. And we pray for a good night's rest that we would awake refreshed and restored. So when that opportunity clock goes off in the morning, that we would be ready to, to be about your work tomorrow. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, according to your will and for your glory. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. Amen. Guys, it's great to be with you tonight. I want to say a special thank you again to our social media team. You guys are just awesome. Um, we just we have a great social media team here. And um, thank you for uh, helping people find stuff on our on our website and our social media, uh, capturing the notes, the ideas. Uh, it's just, you guys are a tremendous blessing. You're just great partners in the gospel. Really looking forward to sharing with you. Um, Tonight we're going to look at Mark chapter 9, and like I mentioned, this is the gospel reading for September 12th, the assigned gospel reading for September 12th, and I, I like to work ahead, people who know me know that, and so I got to spend a couple hours this morning just looking at this and studying it. So let me read for you, you can get out your own Bibles also if you'd like, it's Mark chapter 9, 14 to 29, it says, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, that saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to Jesus and greeted him. So in other words, they, they stopped talking, arguing with the scribes. Jesus asked them, what are you arguing about with them, the scribes? Someone from the crowd answered Jesus, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it, it throws him down. He foams and grinds his teeth. It becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, to cast out this demon, and they were not able. Jesus answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the, the boy fell on the ground, rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood, and it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. 
But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to the Father, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing the child terribly, it came out. The boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He's dead. But Jesus took the boy by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, this kind of demon can only cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And so as I was looking at the text, I was, I was struck by that last verse. Jesus said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And so I want to just share with you a little bit uh, tonight. First of all, I, I want to point out that it was not as if the disciples had never experienced success in driving out demons. This is Mark chapter 9. Three chapters earlier in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 13, we read about Jesus uh, sending the 12 out two by two and giving them authority over unclean spirits. And then verses 12 and 13 says that the 12 went out, they proclaimed that people should repent. And then verse 13, Mark 6, 13, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And so the disciples have already experienced success in casting out demons, okay? I think there's uh, two things for sure to take note of. One is that the disciples were operating under the authority of Jesus, and they were operating per his instructions uh, here in Mark chapter 6, early in Mark chapter 6. It seems that in Mark chapter 9, perhaps the disciples felt they could do it on themselves, do it by themselves. It seems as if uh, the disciples just sort of were freelancing almost, uh, if you will. I think it's also important to note um, that it's shortly after this failure uh, on the part of the disciples, this failure in Mark chapter 9, 29 to drive out this demon, it's, it's like 9, 10 verses later that the disciples tell Jesus this rather interesting thing. Mark 9, 38. Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Now remember what the disciples just failed at, casting out demons. Nine verses later, we hear this. Teacher, Rabbi, Yeshua, Jesus, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop them because he was not following us. Wow, there's just a whole lot in that verse there to, to unpack and look at. Because he was not following us. Jesus, there's... You know, there's, there's 13 of us. You're one of us 13. <laughs> he wasn't following us. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and then, of course, don't miss the obvious thing to, to poke at here a little bit, that they tried to stop this person who was succeeding at doing what they had just failed at. Okay? I think there's an issue here of hubris, of pride, um, the disciples still think it's all about them uh, when really it's all about Jesus. And I just love Jesus' response to the disciples and their whole royal us thinking here. Uh, Mark 9, 39, the very next verse. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon be, will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Um, disciples, are you noting the change from the plural to the singular? Kind of important. Okay. Got to keep the focus where the focus belongs. Focus belongs on Jesus. Okay. Um, regarding the text at hand, Jesus identifies the reason for the disciples' failure. It has to do with their prayers or lack thereof. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking about that a little bit. So what is the problem with their prayers? And you know, there's all sorts of possible um, reasons, problems that they, uh, with their prayers. Uh, I, a couple I can share with you, uh, possibly. Either they were not praying at all, they were, they were not praying at all, or they prayed half-heartedly, as disciples are often want to do, or they were not specific in their prayer request. 
or they were not directive in their prayer requests, or they really doubted God could do anything. Any one of those is common to disciples. We all, if we're just honest about this, we all slip into that in our prayer life at times. And the truth of the matter is, is that there are some people who don't like talking about personal prayer problems because a person's prayer life gets to the heart of their walk with God. But here's one thing I think we should all take away for sure. I think one of the definite lessons of this text is that you cannot take a cookie cutter approach to exorcisms and you definitely cannot take a cookie cutter approach to your prayer time with God. So one of the things I did today uh, as I was looking at this text was, you know, the thought came to me, well, what does the Gospel of Mark say about Jesus and prayer? Um, you know, because you, when you study prayer, you can just type in the word prayer and search verses for prayer. And that's great. That's fine. But sometimes I like to just, you know, look at a particular book or a particular author and, uh, and see, you know, how does the Holy Spirit lead them to speak to us on a given topic? And so the Gospel of Mark has 16 chapters. It's really not that much. You know, I read through it looking for verses that have to do with Jesus and prayer. And uh, it's pretty interesting, the ones that are there. Um, so uh, Mark chapter 1, very first chapter, Mark chapter 1, 35 to 39. And you sort of see a little bit of a bookend here I'm going to point out to you within the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1, 35 to 39 rising very early in the morning while it was still dark Jesus departed went out to a desolate, desolate place and there he prayed and Simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and said to Jesus everyone is looking for you Jesus said to them let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also for that is why I came out and Jesus went throughout all of Galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons so um those two things, preaching and casting out demons. But before all of this begins, before this preaching circuit tour begins, he spends time in prayer. Um, so I just think that's very instructional there. That at the beginning of his ministry, Mark records for us that Jesus uh, begins very early uh, in the morning and very early in the ministry in prayer. Then in Mark chapter 13, 18 to 19, uh, we find a specific incident, incident where Jesus talks about prayer. And this time, Jesus is talking about the importance of prayer in the end times, like at the conclusion of the end times, uh, like shortly before he is going to return, kind of end of the end times. And so Jesus says in Mark 13, 18 to 19, Pray that this does not happen in winter. Jesus is very practical here. He says, for in those days, the end of the end times, there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation. So one of the things that Jesus uh, instructs us regarding prayer is to pray that, um, that, that the tribulation that comes, uh, that the end of the end times, with all of the difficulty that it brings, pray that... Um, that it is not any more difficult for us than it, than it has to be. And Jesus goes on and he does say that, um, that if it was not for the elect, if it was not for the faithful, the tribulation in the end would not have been cut short. So everybody, believer or not believer, has the faithful to be thankful to that the end times will not be as long as they could have been. Um, then another one I want to just uh, draw to your attention here is Mark 14, 32 to 42. This is the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, an important time of prayer uh, with Jesus. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. Obviously, <clears throat> this is uh, the end of Thursday, the beginning of Friday morning of Holy Week. They went to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John, began to be greatly distressed and troubled, Jesus said to these three, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. 
And, he, and then Jesus said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch even an hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, Jesus goes away and prays, saying the same words. Again, Jesus comes back, finds them sleeping again, for their eyes were very heavy. They did not know what to answer Jesus. Jesus came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And so there's really this four times that I see, you know, in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus and the word prayer um, is used specifically. Um, the fourth time, really, it's it, the word prayer is not there, but it is a description of prayer on Jesus' part. Uh, because Jesus is talking to his Father in heaven. And this is, of course, then Jesus on the cross. And uh, it's uh, like immediately before he's going to die, before he's going to breathe his last. Mark 15, 34. At the ninth hour, at three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so... Uh, I think those are four very powerful passages to look at and to study regarding Jesus' prayer life and um, uh, how, how important prayer is to him and where we see prayer in the very important stages of his ministry. I was also struck uh, in looking at this uh, reading um, by um, these words, uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 28, uh, Jesus took him, that's the uh, boy, by the hand and lifted him up. So Jesus has cast out the demon. The boy looks to be dead. What does Jesus do? Jesus takes the boy by the hand and lifted him up and he arose and the boy arose. And I was just very touched by this care, caring act of Jesus, not only exercising the demon, casting the demon out, but then lifting lifting him up, lifting the boy up. And so then I, I did a study uh, in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I just typed in the word up and uh, to look at every time up is used in the Gospel of Mark. And there's, if I remember correctly, 51 times in the ESV translation. And a lot of times the word up has to do with, you know, like direction, things like that. But there were also a lot of times where it has to deal with the effect of Jesus upon others in ministry. And so um, I want to just share these with you. I think they're just very special. They're very neat. So Mark chapter 1, verse 31, listen to these words. And Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. I believe that's one of the disciples' mother-in-laws. Uh, mother, mother-in-law, he only had one mother-in-law. Uh, and so we see in these verses that in Jesus we are lifted up. Mark 2.11, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And so Jesus is directing this person to, to rise and, uh, and to get up and to, to not remain there in that condition anymore. Uh, Mark 2.14, uh, the calling of Matthew, the tax collector. As he passed by, he saw Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said, Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed Jesus. So one of the effects of Jesus upon others is that they rise up from their current circumstance, their current calling condition in life. And they are raised up, they rise up, and the life changes for them. Um, Mark 3.13 says, And Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And so Jesus rose up, and he calls us up into ministry with him. Mark 5.29, the woman with the issue of blood. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And so Another very practical example of the condition of people changing uh, for the better because of Jesus. Mark 5, 42. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And uh, they, they thought she was uh, dead also. 
And then we have the feeding of the 5,000, after which they took up 12 baskets of broken pieces of bread and of the fish. And so remember the disciples didn't think they were going to be able to take care of these people. They wanted Jesus to dismiss them. And when everything's said and done, there's more than enough and they pick it up. Uh, Mark 6, 46, three verses later, after he had taken leave of them, the feeding of the 5,000 and the disciples, after Jesus had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And so um, we see, see that. That's, I just think it's very neat. And then Mark 7, Jesus looked up to heaven. This the focus of Christ, the focus of his ministry, uh, how he changes our focus from looking down at the ground like the disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. They're looking down at the ground and they don't even realize Jesus is right there walking there with them. Looking up to heaven, um, he sighed, Jesus sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Uh, Mark 8, 34, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so that is part of the reality of the upward walk with Christ is that we will also pick up our cross daily and walk with him. And then Mark 9, verse 2, the, the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So I just think it's really interesting to see how Jesus um, lifts up uh, those whom he ministers to. And that is um, the, 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 the result of the gospel for us today is that he came up out of the tomb and we will go up to be with him in heaven. And um, even as he was lifted up upon the tree, so also he will draw all men unto him. Amen. Amen. So what do we do with all of this as we look at the disciples and their, and their ministry? You know, I think that honestly, uh, in many ways, the disciples did not have a stellar prayer life. There were many times that their prayer life fell short. And I think honestly that there are many times that Jim Buckman's prayer life also falls short. And I'm guessing that you would probably say, me too, you know? But here's the really good news, that while the disciples may not have had a stellar prayer life and that while I as a disciple today may not have a stellar prayer life, the good news is Jesus does. He has a perfect prayer life. And it says in Romans that he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for us, as does the Holy Spirit. And so we can rest assured that our prayers are come, the prayer, things that need to be prayed about for in our life are coming to the Father and they're coming to him perfectly. And that gives us great peace and comfort regardless of our circumstances or our shortcomings. It's great to be back with you in our daily devotionals. It was great to have the focus of Holy Week and uh, it's great to now continue in this way with you as well. Uh, I pray for your richest guys wish blessings upon your evening and i pray for i would ask for your prayers uh we are going to be interviewing three candidates tonight uh for our director for worship and music uh so my i'm going to sit in on an interview at eight and then uh 8 30 um and then nine or 9 30 is i think 9 30 is the final one and so uh please keep us uh, in your prayers as we Try to see who God wants us to have as our director for worship and music at our church. God's blessed us with 20 candidates. It's so amazing. So uh, let us go in peace. Let us serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.